Welcome everyone to the launch coverage of Axiom Mission 3, also known as AX3. The clock is actively counting down at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and our four all European crew members are already on board and strapped into Dragon, preparing for liftoff from Launch Complex 39A. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Rackham, Spacesuit Ventilation Lead for Axiom Space based in Houston, Texas, and I am very excited to be covering Axiom's third crewed mission to the International Space Station. And I'm Kate Tice, Senior Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX. It's so great to have you back with us once again, Thank you, John. Kate. I'm excited. We're here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, with SpaceX Mission Control Center just behind us, actually live view there inside Dragon Capsule with our AX3 crew. We're counting down to our first human spaceflight mission of 2024. AX3 follows a busy 2023 where SpaceX completed 96 missions delivering astronauts, cargo, satellites, and other cool payloads to orbit. This includes the second Axiom mission, AX2, which launched to the International Space Station in May of last year. Yeah, that's right, Kate. 2023 was a significant year for Axiom Space, which saw progress on the development of Axiom Station, as well as our lunar spacesuits for NASA and the Artemis program. And as you mentioned, all of this was punctuated by the success Dragon of our AX2 mission, which saw three new astronauts fly to orbit under the command of Peggy Whitson. I am a... Flight computer is now transitioning to pad hatch closed. And as a final reminder, ensure all items are secure from now through launch. Copy all, Jake, and please thank the advanced team and the closeout team for their fine work today. You got it, Mike. I'll relay the message. All right, so there on the right-hand side of your screen, that's SpaceX core or crew operations and resource engineer for today, that's Jake Vendel. Uh, we'll be hearing him communicate with the crew quite often today as mm -hmm. he is the primary voice uh, to the crew, both while they are in space, uh, as well as still on the ground as we see them here. Uh, that's a live view between our commander, Michael Lopez Alegria, and our pilot, Walter Villaday. Uh, there on the left-hand side of your screen. So, John, you were talking about Peggy Whitson. Uh, I am a big fan of Peggy, and it was just so awesome to see her in the commander's chair for that AX2 mission. I know, I'm super excited as well, Kate. So, you were talking there about the core. Let's go ahead and take a look at our crew who's on Dragon today. All right, well, this crew is the first all-European crew. We have our commander MLA, Michael Lopez Alegria, but beyond that, it's noteworthy to note that the AX3 is the first all European commercial crew to visit the orbiting lab, including the first astronaut from the country of Turkey. So we have a lot of ground to cover today, but our, but our immediate focus is those four astronauts that you see on the screen. So let's go ahead and introduce them to you now. As I mentioned, first up, the commander of our flight today, Michael Lopez Alegria, or MLA, is no stranger to human spaceflight. He is a dual citizen of the United States and Spain. AX3 marks his sixth mission to space, having completed three space shuttle flights and a Soyuz mission as a NASA astronaut, prior to commanding AX1 with Axiom Space. MLA holds the NASA Dragon record SpaceX, for both the total number awareness. of spacewalks. We're commencing a health check for the launch escape system. Expect a momentary flight computer change, and then we'll go back to pad hatch closed. Good job, Jake. MLA holds the NASA record for both the total number of spacewalks, or EVAs, and the cumulative amount of time spent conducting spacewalks. In 2020, he was inducted into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame, and today, when he's not in low Earth orbit, MLA serves as Axiom Space's chief astronaut. Our pilot on today's flight, Colonel Walter Villaday from the Italian Air Force, is taking his inaugural trip to low Earth orbit. Villaday currently serves in the Italian Air Force and as head of the Italian Air Force's representative office in the United States. He has completed cosmonaut training as a space engineer, participated in multiple analog training missions, and flown a variety of aircraft and missions as an active flight engineer in the Italian Air Force. This mission is significant for Italy in that it commemorates the 100th year since the founding of the Italian Air Force. And our third crew member for today's mission is Mission Specialist Alper Izarache. Through this mission, Alper becomes the first Turkish astronaut to go to space. With 15 years of experience across a myriad of aircraft for the Turkish Air Force, Izarache got his start in the Air Force Academy in Istanbul, Turkey, and earned a master's degree from the U.S. Air Force Institute of Technology. 
He then flew as a commercial airline captain for several years before returning to duty in the Turkish Air Force. And on a further note, this mission marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Republic of Turkey. And finally, we have Mission Specialist Marcus Wandt, a lieutenant colonel in the Swedish Air Force. He flew nine years as a fighter pilot and graduated from the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School at the top of his class. In November of 2022, Marcus was selected by the European Space Agency, or ESA, as an astronaut reserve. However, with the AX3 mission, he becomes the first project astronaut in ESA's history, a new, a new designation in their ranks. In just a few short hours, he'll be only the second ESA astronaut of Swedish nationality to ever go to the International Space Station, a milestone marked in a year of jubilee as the 500th anniversary of the founding of the country of Sweden. So as you can see there, this crew has an immense amount of training behind them, both individually and as a team. They bring years and years of experience and preparation to this mission, and together they make up that first all-European crew, each proudly representing their respective nations. Missions like AX3 help expand that path to low Earth orbit and open up the doors to others to follow. So this crew is prepared, they're now strapped in and ready, so let's recap how they got to this point. Crew first started their day with ending their pre-flight quarantine phase. They took a flight to KSC. They got to see their vehicle as they flew in to the launch landing facility at Kennedy Space Center. And at that point, they arrived to be able to say goodbye to their friends and family and wave to them before getting handed over to SpaceX for the rest of their day. At T minus four hours, we had the weather briefing. Actually there, uh, we can see the first view of the crew as they exited the Falcon support building that's about a half mile down the road from the launch pad. I love this part where they get a little wave. <laughs> <laughs> they then got into the Teslas, which transported them up, like I said, about a half mile to the launch pad. Um, of course, they're physically fit, they could walk <laughs> it, but we wanna make sure they stay cool and comfortable. Uh, so these are the Teslas arriving to the launch pad. And one of my, um, oh, this is a great view here of the crew. Just look at that calm, that patience. Uh, I feel like if that were me, I would just be busting with excitement. Yeah, well, I'm, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then they get out of the Teslas. Uh, and then, you know, one of my favorite moments for whenever we launch astronauts from pad 39A is coming up. Um, it's really, we should come up with it like this astronaut lean yeah. back something where this excitement of seeing their spaceship for the first time on launch day. Of course, they have seen Dragon, they've seen Falcon before. And now at this point, we can see crew walking down. There you can see Marcus Want and Alper Izarache. They're giving a thumbs up. They are excited to be on this flight today, and we're excited to have them. All right, so as we saw uh, right, actually that view right there, the crew, they are already in their chairs. They're strapped in. Um, they are still, uh, the, the closeout team ex on the exterior, still working through the side hatch closure. Um, but coming up next, we will have, actually you can see that closeout team there. So this involves closing the hatch, uh, inflating the seal around the hatch to um, make sure that the pressure is good. And then they hold that pressure there to make sure there's no decay or leaking from that side hatch seal. Once we get confirmation that that hatch seal is good, we'll be good to go. Um, after that, uh, we are expecting a um, post ingress brief to occur. Uh, we'll also have crew access arm, which is where these individuals are standing right now. This is in the crew access arm. As the name suggests, this is what allows the crew to access the Dragon capsule side hatch there, as you see. So we're going to retract that away. Uh, then we'll step into propellant loading, terminal count, and obviously the moment that we're all in excitedly anticipating in just under two hours from now, liftoff. So with all of that, let's check in with Ronnie for a countdown status update. Thanks, Kate. I'm Ronnie Farman, a commercial sales manager here at SpaceX. We are currently just about one hour and 57 minutes away from launch, and everything looks good for an on-time liftoff later today. As Kate mentioned, the crew did receive a weather briefing just after T minus four hours. As we approach liftoff, our teams are tracking weather all along the ascent and recovery corridors, ensuring that Falcon 9 is ready for launch and that all possible recovery zones are available if needed. We're currently tracking roughly a 20% chance of weather violation today. And the main constraint we're looking at is ground weather at the launch site. We'll keep you posted throughout the countdown as we continue to monitor those environments. But at pad 39A, which you've got a view of on your screen, our teams are hard at work. Falcon 9 is powered up. Engine checkouts were performed overnight and the pressurization of the gas storage tanks were completed earlier today, around T minus six hours. 
Just a few minutes ago, Falcon began its final checks for launch, including a communication check with the crew, which should be coming up here shortly. At T minus 45 minutes, our launch director will pull the team for propellant loading. And if we're go, propellant load will begin at T minus 35 minutes. Now, as with all of our launches to the International Space Station, we have an instantaneous launch window, which today is at 4.49 p.m. Eastern. The reason we need a specific time is because Dragon is basically trying to catch up to the ISS, which as we speak is orbiting the Earth at roughly 17,500 miles per hour. That means we have to deliver Dragon to the correct orbit, and we also need to time its trajectory relative to the orbiting laboratory so that they are both in the same place in orbit at the same time. A precise liftoff is crucial for achieving that timely, rende timely rendezvous between Dragon and the space station. If, of course, for any reason we are not able to launch today, our next opportunity will be at 4 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. That's the latest update for now, and I'll check, again, check in again as we get closer to liftoff. Back to you, Kate. Thanks, Ronnie. Speaking of liftoff, let's take a closer look at the vehicles that will be taking the AX-3 crew to the International Space Station today. At the very top of the vehicle with, uh, is there at our Dragon spacecraft. This is where the crew is currently sitting and will spend their 32-hour flight to the International Space Station. This marks our 12th overall human spaceflight mission in the last four years, and in this time, Dragon has flown 38 people to orbit and back, plus the additional four NASA Crew-7 members that are still on orbit at the space station. Dragon and the AX-3 crew will be delivered to orbit today by the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, which provides 1.7 million pounds of thrust uh, there on its first stage thanks to uh, the nine Merlin M1D engines. Named after the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars, the number nine refers to the nine Merlin engines that power Falcon 9's first stage. Since taking flight in 2010, our Falcon 9 rocket has made 298 flights and delivered all sorts of payloads to orbit. After today's launch, the first stage will return to SpaceX's landing zone one at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, which you see a live view of that there on the right-hand side of your screen. It's about nine miles as the crow flies from pad 39A. Fun fact, this is actually the same landing zone where Falcon 9 made its first successful landing attempt back in 2015. So if it looks familiar, that's why. <laughs> Since then, we have continued to recover and refly our first stage boosters, performing 235 repeat flights in total. Below the Dragon is the Falcon 9 second stage. Its job today is to secure Dragon's entry into low Earth orbit before separating, leaving Dragon to continue its journey to the space station on its own thrusters. Reusability is the key to making spaceflight more routine and ultimately what will enable humans to become multiplanetary. Both the first stage booster and the Dragon spacecraft that you see there will be uh, that are flying today, they're both flight proven. The first stage has supported four previous missions, while this Dragon capsule has supported two previous missions. That's right, Kate. In fact, the AX-2 crew that flew in May 2023 launched on this same first stage Dragon booster. Dragon SpaceX, back with you with some good news. Good side hatch leak check. Copy off. Thanks, Jake. All right, good news there. We yeah. got confirmation that that leak check was good. So the side hatch is now closed Excellent. and it will remain closed until the crew comes back to Earth uh, in about two weeks. Fantastic. All right, well, still looking at that view there. Um, as we mentioned, the AX-2 crew that flew in May 2023 launched on this exact same booster and flew the second flight of this Dragon capsule. So maybe when we get some views inside the cabin, we'll get to see an AX-2 mission patch in there later. <laughs> as for the maiden flight, that was with NASA's Crew-4. And as the first crew to fly in this capsule, they had the honor of naming it, which is pretty cool because once a spacecraft is named, it will continue to go by that name for all future flights. Anyway, they chose the name Freedom. Crew-4 commander Chel Lindgren said that the name was chosen because it celebrates a fundamental human right and the industry and innovation that emanate from the unencumbered human spirit. The name also honors Freedom 7, which of course is the space capsule used by Alan Shepard's Mercury Redstone 3, the first U.S. human spaceflight mission, which took place on May 5th, 1961. Yeah, Kate, I love that. On that note, right, with Alper on board, Turkey A is taking their first step into human spaceflight on a capsule named after one that first carried the United States into space. It feels like such a poignant underscore to this historic event for the people of Turkey. Absolutely. Now, speaking of Alper, let's talk about the training and th that he and all the rest of the AX-3 crew have completed in order to be prepared for this mission. As you might imagine, astronaut training is extensive. 
from the training that is specific to each crew member's role to learning SpaceX protocols, ISS systems, and preparing for the science and outreach activities that they'll be conducting in space, private astronaut training is rigorous. Altogether, the AX-3 crew spent about 35 days training inside Dragon. To prepare them for flight, our teams at SpaceX spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics and how to live in microgravity. We also used our Dragon training capsules to run simulations of ascent, ISS rendezvous, and reentry. The training program includes nearly 100 different lessons covering all aspects of the flight. The team also spent time at the launch pad in our suit-up room and working through emergency procedures that would be necessary in the unlikely event of a pad abort scenario. Right, and beyond these efforts to get to and from station, this crew also spent months training for life on orbit. Living and working in microgravity presents its own set of unique challenges, and skill-specific training flows and simulations help ensure that when crew crosses that hatch, that they're ready to maximize their time on orbit and accomplish their mission objectives. So not only did they need to be certified by instructors at NASA, JAXA, ESA, and Axiom Space, but they also needed to train with the Axiom Space Operations Team, who will help them conduct their on-orbit events. Ultimately, this team supports crew 24-7 for their duration of their mission. And in order to best facilitate this level of coordination, Axiom Space has leaned on the lessons learned of those who have flown before and built a team that is capable of tailoring a mission to the specific goals of our customers. As we know, every mission is unique. For AX-3, the Italian Air Force, the Turkish Space Agency, and ESA each have their own specific mission objectives for their respective crew members, and together, we are ready to ensure that they meet those goals. Here's a look at what it takes to pull off all the training and rehearsals together to facilitate a successful Axiom mission. The intention is to open access to space. What we're built for is to do that. Suddenly kids in Turkey might see the world differently and they might see their possibilities of what they can do with their lives differently because they see a countryman uh, flying in space. We want to enable outreach events. We want to enable science. And part of that is having the support personnel on the ground to be there in real time, working with the astronauts as they go and execute those specific things. So this is the Axiom Mission Control Center, or we like to call it MCCA. And this is built to allow the Axiom Flight Controller team to execute private astronaut missions. We also give our customers the ability to follow along a mission by either providing them voice or video and to participate in the mission. Crew starts about eight months out from their mission. We do onboarding at Axiom to show them what our team's all about, introduce them to all the people that are going to be helping them on their journey. And then for the next few months, they go between NASA training centers and JAXA and ESA and our vehicle provider. It's a bit of putting pedal to the metal immediately once they get here and then they're clearly shot from around. Okay. Two, one, and lift off, go active. We're looking at folks who have medical backgrounds that may not have been flown in the past, which is quite a challenge for the medical team, but at the same time, it's very satisfying. The thing that drives me is knowing that maybe one day, based on some of the work that I'm doing, one of my kids can go to space, or any of these kids that are watching the launches, eyes wide, um, maybe they have minor medical issues or major medical issues that they think right now precludes them from becoming an astronaut, and that might not be true in, in 5, 10, 15 years down the line. We are actually in a very exciting stage because we are dialing in and getting comfortable with our short duration missions. And now we're moving towards how do we live in space in our own Axiom module and how do we eventually separate our own station? We're very excited about the opportunity to be part of that and excited about being able to really shape that. And I think Axiom Space is shaping how the global space community is getting space. You know, this really is truly a fascinating time for spaceflight. Okay, as you know, it takes a village to pull this kind of thing off. Nothing about human spaceflight is ever routine. It demands discipline, vigilance, competence, confidence, and ultimate responsibility. And we have a responsibility to our customers, our partners, and the world to demonstrate that we embody those values of human spaceflight, to show that this is what we do. And our mission is to enable and ensure global successful access to LEO and beyond. At the end of the day, we wanna say, the door's open. Come join the adventure. The AX3 mission and its crew represent another critical step along that path to opening up low Earth orbit. So to get better acquainted with our AX3 crew and the agencies they represent, let's head over now to Sonia Gavankar McKay, Axiom Space's Director of Digital Strategy at the Kennedy Space Center. Sonia, you've had a chance to talk with teams from each of the European nations represented on board today. 
Is there a common theme in what they're anticipating for this mission? Absolutely. Thanks, John. You can feel the excitement here at OSB2 with our special guests who had a hand in making this mission a success. Our partners are moments away from seeing our shared success in opening LEO to even more countries. We'll hear from representatives from each of our crew members' home nations in just a moment. But let's start with Walter Villaday. Walter has been part of Team Axiom Space for years, starting back as a backup crew member for AX2. Just another moment in his long journey to space. Let's hear more from him on this moment in his career. On the Air Force flag, we have three words. Virtute siderum tenus, with bravery to the stars. Those words still are in my heads, especially now, because they were a really strong motivation to me to keep going. The most difficult part is not to become an astronaut, it's being an astronaut. It's be patient and waiting your time. It's not the same for everyone. For our family, they've been along with me through all over this journey. It took almost uh, 12 years to get to this point. After so many years of uh, waiting, they really see this opportunity, this mission as, uh, hey, that you in the end really make it. I am Colonel Walter Villadei, Italian Air Force, AX3 pilot. The great opportunity was to join the Air Force when I was around 19 years old. Going to the Italian Air Force Academy was a kind of a turning point to me. I was the right person at the right moment in the right place, and I had the opportunity to become the first space engineer in the Air Force. Walter's been at this for a long time. He did several rounds of training at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, and so he is no stranger to what it's like. I was deployed in Russia for 18 months just to go through the entire cosmonaut training. It's very interesting. It's a completely, I guess, a very unconventional path, but really fascinating. Our mission specialists have been cleared to unstrap and enjoy the zero-G experience. I had the privilege to fly with the Virgin Galactic suborbitally, and of course, it's not exactly the same, but nevertheless, I was strong. I'm the eighth Italian astronaut flying to space. For Italy, it's a very important because this is the first mission that we are doing in the commercial space flight. There's a lot of opportunity at stake for Italy, for the Italian people that are looking at space as a real future for them. This crew is amazing, and it's not just a pure formal statement. I'm learning from all of them. I hope to bring, of course, some positive uh, in this uh, interpersonal relationship. The friendship with these guys, it's an amazing gift. I really hope that this uh, mission can inspire the Italian young generation to look at space as an opportunity and to believe in their dreams. I'm joined now by Colonel Domenico Antonacci, who is here with the Italian Air Force Space General Office. Thank you so much for joining us. The relationship between Italy and Axiom Space goes so far. We've been partners for a long time. Talis Helenia Space is building our shells for the Axiom Station modules. Tell me a little bit about why this mission is happening now and what you're looking forward to in the success. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, very nice to be here. Uh, the uh, paradigm has changed. The reason for what we ask is the space today is not the same uh, that was in the past. Uh, as a, a Ministry of Defense in Italy, and especially the Italian Air Force, uh, more than 15 years ago, uh, we started to uh, take care of what is the human space flight, especially uh, uh, the, we had the Italian Air Force involved in what is the research in space. Uh, so uh, this process comes back from so a long time and uh, after that, a few years later, we did an agreement with the Italian uh, Space Agency and uh, it was at that point that we were looking to, after the uh, 2011 with the Space Shuttle retirement, mm. we were looking at what was the future. So the ideas we had back at that time proved to be uh, really, really uh, innovative today. 
that's great that you're taking advantage of these opportunities. What are the goals for space right now? What are the Italian goals in space? The Italian goals, the uh, Ministry of Defense or the Air Force are the same as the government goals. Uh, what we do, we not only are looking at the research part, that for sure is one of our priority. As you know, uh, extra mission as uh, a big part of the experiments are broke mm -hmm. by uh, Italy. Uh, also, what we are trying to do here is to having uh, the uh, defense uh, in this particular case, uh, leading uh, not only the enterprises in Italy to give them an opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, be part of the space economy, but also uh, other uh, government organization. So with us, for example, the uh, Italian Space Agency is uh, our big part uh, partner for research, and not only that, also very, very uh, small business and uh, the largest business we have in Italy. Research and the portfolio that, the research portfolio that the Italians are doing that Walter is focused on for this mission is so impressive. What does it mean for the research com community to have that kind of focus during this 14-day mission? You know, it's not easy uh, to take research to space, so we are really proud to give the opportunity uh, to a uh, uh, um, big part of Italy, not only, like I said, uh, uh, not only the enterprises, uh, and it's not only, in this case, the Ministry of Defense. Walter, for sure, is an Italian Air Force guy, so he's in the Ministry of Defense. With us, uh, a lot of other government agencies have been working uh, with us. Uh, all together for the research uh, with, uh, that Walter will be executing in the next day. Uh, let me mention uh, yes. a few of those, the uh, principles uh, uh, that uh, work with us. For example, the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, the uh, uh, Food Sovereignty and uh, Forestry. Also the Ministry of Enterprises and uh, Made in Italy was part uh, uh, among our partnerships. And like I said, also for the research part, we have been uh, working close together with the Italian Space Agency. That's wonderful. And he, you know, Walter brings that, that focus of a pilot now to the research that he's going to be doing in low Earth orbit. Congratulations on this milestone in, in your history, celebrating the years of the Italian Air Force. This is an exciting time. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the entire Italian contingent for celebrating with us. Just a couple of moments, we'll, we'll be really celebrating. Thank you. And uh, go, Walter, and go, X3. Thank you so much. Stay right there. We're going to now turn over to meet some folks over on Mars. Marcus's team, our next crew member to highlight, is the first ESA project astronaut in history. You can see how Marcus was selected for this mission. He doesn't do anything halfway. When he goes after something, he's all in. And right now, his sights are set on space. Before doing a complex or high-risk flight test, I always specialize getting in there, starting up the engine, taxiing out, getting the thrust going, holding the brakes, releasing, feeling the acceleration, then lift off. This time that will be the same, going into the Dragon capsule, sitting there, having all that force working and pushing us away from Earth, up into space. It's going to be a very strong feeling, I believe. That's something I'm really looking forward to. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> as soon as I met him, I was struck by his persona. Marcus is very technically competent, and he has great interpersonal skills. He went to the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, finished first in his class, which is not something I could say. He's a wonderful guy, so joyful, so extrovert. I'm so happy to have him as my counterpart, Marcus's just like a brother to me. On top of that, Marcus is a fellow Scandinavian, which already qualifies him in my book. During my time in, in the army and going to university, studying to become an engineer, I figured that if I'm gonna do it, then why not do it full out? When I start doing something, I build a very big interest of what I'm doing and I, I kind of become passionate about it. I guess the thoughts about being an astronaut has been there uh, on and off uh, as many dreams. I just uh, figured it required an extreme amount of luck. 
the European Space Agency needed new astronauts. That does not happen very often. Luckily, my wife saw this ad where they called for astronauts. I saw that a couple of hundred thousand people had looked at that page. So, okay, this is highly unlikely or nearly impossible, but not impossible. So why not? And then I applied and it turned out that it, it, it worked out. Markus is one of ESA's new project astronauts, which means that he's been hired to take advantage of these new exciting opportunities that commercial spaceflight offers us. My ESA mission is Moonin. That's one of uh, Odin, the Viking gods, two ravens. Odin sent them out to fly around the world and gather and bring back knowledge. The other raven is Hugin. That is the name of Andy Morgus's mission being up in space right now. So now Moonin will fly up, meet Hugin, and we'll together orbit Earth and get that knowledge back. The idea of a project astronaut and being a part of pioneering that, together with Sweden and then ESA, together with Axiom, making this possible, opening up that way of accessing space for Europe. Sweden is in there helping to make that happen, and that makes me proud. I'm joined now by Daniel Neunschwander, Director of Human and Robotic Programs for ESA. Welcome another exciting moment and milestone in Swedish history, in ESA history. ESA just launched this Reserve Astronaut Program. Tell us why that was something that you augmented your programming with and what it's done for the success of ESA. So, good afternoon to all. First, uh, these Reserve Astronauts are, in fact, talents which are set in a pool who have been selected out of over 22,000 applications and when the opportunity arises uh, they can become project astronaut as Marcos today mm -hmm. and I'm really excited because it allows us to do more space activities it allows us to serve ultimately more member states of the European Space Agency. So as a reserve astronaut Marcus had like a two-year window, right? This is very fast to be going up into space. What was that timeline like for ESA and for Marcus? So first, uh, let's recall, he has been selected in uh, November 2022. We are now in January 24th. It hasn't even been two years, Kennedy right? Space okay. Center. It's one year and three months. Yeah. It's so exciting. I think it shows that uh, we can really be fast. We can really be fast when we want. Mm. I should also thank all the actors who made it happen because it really required an alignment of the planets, literally. Uh, let me first start by thanking Sweden, who uh, took the decision to finance uh, this mission. Uh, let me thank industry, who made it happen, Axiom notably, but ultimately also uh, my team, because there is also a big uh, scientific program behind uh, the mission of Marcus yes. and his uh, training for him. And it was a, a game changer, and I'm happy to be here today. Well, let's talk about that game-changing research. He is 14 days on this mission, very aggressive portfolio that he's going to be chasing to make sure that he's doing all that. Tell us some about those goals, some of those projects he's working on, and what ESA's looking forward to when he comes back. So first and above all, our main objective is uh, to bring forward science very clearly. We have yes. multiple uh, uh, disciplines here. Here It starts, for example, with bone health to take you uh, to give you one example, it goes uh, then over to technology demonstrators. So we really cover our different discipline, human physiology, uh, biology, material science, uh, up to techno demonstration. So I think this is really a very nice program. Over 20 experiments, which will be done in less than uh, 14, uh, 14 days. 14 days. So that's really amazing. And on top of that, let's also not forget the second objective, which is about education, which is about right. outreach. And uh, Marcus will do here a great job. And Marcus has such enthusiasm and such energy. So, of course, people who are going to be tuning in for that educational outreach will be, of course, inspired by his journey and, and by the work that you're all doing. What is the next step for ESA? Where, where are you going next in this private astronaut missions and commercial projects? So, first above all, Marcus is already inspirational for all our uh, colleagues, uh, for uh, people who work with him before he have even uh, launched space and he will of course touch much more uh, future generations when he comes back and can share with us his real experience in, in space. That's really uh, the big difference. And then in terms of commercial activities, we are really uh, steeping uh, up significantly our work at the European Space Agency. Uh, we have commercial programs nearly in all domains we work today. In exploration, we definitely want to, to have more commercial 
actors when it comes also to our uh, transport delivery missions. Uh, we want to have more commercial actors when it comes also to human space flight activities, for sure. And in this context, uh, we, we will also have more project astronauts in the future, and I'm happy to come back here to Kennedy Space Center. So we're excited for Hugen and Munin, who are going to be joined together out in low Earth orbit on the ISS. Thank you so much to ESA for being such a wonderful partner with Axiom Space, doing wonderful work together. I hope that this is the start of a wonderful relationship that we take into the future. Thank you. Looking forward. That we have some more crew members to introduce you to. Our next crew member is from the country of Turkey. We want to highlight the ambitions of this mission and the future in space for the country of Turkey. Here's more on Alper's inspired and unexpected adventure leading to low Earth orbit. When I was five years old or six years old, I was in our village. I was next to my grandmother when I first saw an airplane. I immediately told her, I want to be the driver of that plane. I have always been amused with the feeling of being able to do any kind of maneuver in the sky with wings. The most that I could make it so far was 51,000 feet. I'm really wondering how I'm gonna feel like when I look at the blue earth with my bare eyes. It is gonna be an amazing feeling being able to fly in a space without any wings. Space has never been a part of my dreams, ever. Because as a country, we were completely out of this field. So when it comes to space, when I saw it in the documentaries or the movies, I would always immediately encourage myself, hey, that dream belongs to other nations. Onuncu ve son hedefimiz. Evet. Bir Türk vatandaşını uzaya göndermektir. In the middle of the night, I'm coming back from an operational flight and I see the news. It is our president announcing their monumental decision to send the very first Turkish person into the space on our centennial history. For a country like Turkey, it's important. That is just opening a curtain which has always been blocking the dreams of our children. And from that moment on, I started to think about it seriously. It was a really long, rigorous process that we went through. At the end, we were selected to the program. It felt great. It felt amazing. Alper is polite. He's uh, also extremely competent professionally, very thorough. He's very humble, but he's very precise, uh, very, very unique person. Even though we come from very different cultures, our backgrounds are similar, so our common language was easy to find. My name is not important. The important thing for the people is to remember that their country has been determined enough to be able to step into the future, to be able to dream not to the limits of the sky, but deep into space. I'm joined now by Mehmed, Mehmed Fatih Kajer, the Republic of Turkey's Minister of Industry and Technology. It has been an absolute pleasure to work with your country and with Alper. He is inspiring. He's poetic. Tell us about this mission and what it means for all of the country of Turkey. Actually, this is a very historic and proud moment for our country. And it's also a testament uh, to our nation's advancement in science and technology is it's the first manned space mission of our country. And I think that this is not only a significant milestone in the history of our country, but also a very strong source of inspiration for Turkish children and youth. Now, the country of Turkey has been involved in human space flight in the research category for over 30 years. You've been doing all this aggressive research in space and low Earth orbit. Tell me about the research that Alper is going to be continuing and what kind of portfolio of opportunities that you're going to be working on over the next 14 days. 
Actually, as Turkey, we are very experienced in space technologies. We are developing and manufacturing our own satellites, our own observation, and also communication satellites. And also, we can develop and produce the rockets to reach the space. But when it comes to manned space missions, it's now the very first time for us. And this mission will be also a scientific mission. Alper Gezeravci will conduct 13 different scientific uh, experiments at ISS. All experiments are prepared by Turkish scientists. And we think that those scientific experiments will uh, serve the scientific literature in the world. And some of them are on biology and genetics, and some of them are also on material science, but all of them are very innovative, and we, we will uh, wait for the results of those scientific studies very soon. That's the wonderful thing about these, these short duration missions is that that research comes back immediately for all the data be, to be processed. We're going to be talking a little bit more with Lucy Lowe, our chief scientist, in a couple of minutes about the entire portfolio of this mission. It's exciting work and I can't wait to get into it. So you talked a little bit about the 30-year history. We talked about the research that's been ongoing. Talk to me about what the future of human space exploration looks like for the country of Turkey. Actually, as Turkey, we are uh, uh, ex uh, we are working on the national space program, uh, and we have very assertive targets uh, for next 10 years uh, on space technologies. This is a manned space mission, but we also have some unmanned space missions. Uh, we uh, aim to reach the moon with, with a uh, space system developed and again manufactured by Turkish scientists and engineers. And after this mission, we will send uh, the second Turkish astronaut for a, a suborbit flight. And then we hope that we will have many different manned missions next year. Well, you're doing wonderful work. You've accomplished so much. It's been a pleasure to have you, Alper, the entire country along with us. I cannot wait for this historic moment for all of these wonderful countries and partners. Thank you so much. And go AX3 and go to the country of Turkey. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And we thank you all and all partners in this historic mission. Indeed, indeed. We have one more crew member to introduce you to, and that is our commander. Michael Lopez Alegria is the commander of this history historic AX-3 spaceflight mission. He is an icon, and we are proud to have him leading the way. I feel truly blessed and lucky to have had this career path. This is a dream come true. This is somebody who has gotten to play at the major league level 20 years after retirement, it is still the most uh, uncomparable experience you can imagine. In fact, difficult to imagine. Michael Lopez Alegria was born in Madrid, Spain, grew up in California, and has been a naval aviator since 1981. I already knew about uh, uh, Mike uh, since he was uh, one of the most experienced and ever flown uh, astronauts in NASA. Being super experienced, Still being humble and very keyed in on listening on what the crew needs. To fly with him, and even more important, uh, to learn from him, it's a huge opportunity. This being an old military crew, having someone that's keeping that down a little bit, keeping it a little bit informal, is very important. We are so lucky, we are so privileged to have the most experienced person of NASA and its history to be leading in our mission. Three. Two, I think it's my duty to try to warn them about what it's going to feel like, especially physiologically, because I want them to be prepared for that. But as far as the experience goes, I just want them to have it. To soak it up and let it go through their pores and feel what it's like. The AX3 guys are super solid. I am learning alongside them. We're learning together as a crew. I want them to feel like we're all in this together. I think we're constantly redefining access to low Earth orbit 
and we do that by opening the door to individuals, but also to nations, nations who, like Turkey, have never had an astronaut in their history. These are important steps, they're great milestones in really opening the aperture to allow more people, more researchers, more institutions have access to space. I'm Michael Lopez Alegria and I'm commander of AX3. The AX3 crew has been a pleasure to support. It's been an inspiring journey to watch as Michael Lopez Alegria's leadership really kicked in with this crew as they learned together. And I think all of our partners are really, I want to thank them for helping us learn more about each of the astronauts and their countries and their missions over the last couple of minutes. From the whole Axiom space team, we send our own well wishes. Go AX3. Ronnie, back to you. We are currently T minus one hour and 21 minutes away from launch as the AX3 crew awaits its 4.49 p.m. Eastern liftoff from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. Right now, the all-European crew is safely inside the Dragon capsule and the side hatch was closed for flight at around T minus two hours and 19 minutes. As we heard a few minutes ago, we've already gotten that good call out that the hatch leak check was successfully completed. We're standing by right now for a post-ingress crew briefing, which should be held sometime in the next few minutes. That's where we'll give the crew any important updates about things we're tracking that could impact our countdown today. But the good news is that weather continues to be go for launch and any contingencies if needed. Right now, our closeout crew is doing final preparations. Next up, at T minus 45 minutes, our launch director will pull the team for propellant load. Just a few minutes later, the crew arm will begin to retract, and a few minutes after that, at T minus 39 minutes, the launch escape system will be armed. Propellant load should then begin at T minus 35. So far, it has been a smooth countdown, and everything is on track for an on-time liftoff a little bit more than an hour from now. With that update, I'll hand it back to you, John. Thanks a lot, Ronnie. Well, Kate, as we watched the video earlier and we heard, you know, this mission really represents three very different paths to this moment for this whole crew. But yet, here each of all of them are in their final preparations for an entirely new journey, both personally, professionally, and culturally. Quite honestly, I don't think missions like this ever get old for me. Yeah, I mean, how can they? Every crew is a different team yeah. and every team has their own dynamics. And it's just incredible to see how you know, people that were four strangers come together and be such a close-knit, really, flight family. <laughs> yeah, and watching their interviews together too, you can see that they're prepared, but they're also so humble. And yeah. I think that's what's really appealing about this and inspiring about this is, it's not about them individually, it's about the team and what they represent for their countries and yeah. what they're doing on orbit. Um, so while they're looking at that work doing on orbit, we know that a lot of that is training for their research, right? That really puts into sharp focus just what all this preparation has been for. Training the crew to conduct their research efforts is one piece of this puzzle. But another aspect to a successful spaceflight mission is the effort behind the scenes. Preparing the research payloads, writing the procedures, and coordinating all of the logistics for that research to be loaded and flown to space. To be successful, that entire effort requires an army of dedicated and talented team members. For organizations considering a research study in microgravity, or for entities looking to demonstrate a new capability off-planet, Axiom Space is built to do just that. We're a company that's focused not just on flying people, but really creating the markets, creating the products, creating the services, creating the reasons to be in space. And when you provide that access, you say, what is it that you need in space? We can help you get that. Axion's objective is to increase access to countries and people and investigators to go to orbit. We want to have more folks interested in commercializing space, to actually use it as a tool and develop things, products that might be used here on Earth. We can do all the research certification, all the research preparation work that's needed. We can do the integration for those payloads, which means that you get all of the hardware and the software and the crew procedures and the crew training together. We can do the cargo services where you pack everything in kits so that when the crew opens them on orbit, they have everything they need for a certain project. We have some amazing partners that we're working with. National Stem Cell Foundation is actually doing research on Parkinson's and MS. The Sanford Stem Cell Institute is doing tumor organoid research. Our ability to really accelerate the development of those proof of concept studies provides an opportunity for us to help people see science from a completely different perspective. 
and to really do things with more flexibility and get as much science as we possibly can out of each one of these missions. These are the differences that we're seeing with commercial space stations and private astronaut missions. When I think of building commercial markets in low Earth orbit, we're really expanding the definition of global to include 250 miles up. We are doing it now. We are operating. We are opening up access to space. But the future is going to require us to take even more steps. And we've got a head start on all of that with all these missions that we're doing now. Today, it's a few nations. Tomorrow, it should be many nations. And it should be a diverse ecosystem just like it is on Earth today. Of course, a significant amount of the research and experiments performed in orbit need to be brought back, as Dragon is the only spacecraft currently flying that is capable of returning significant, significant amounts of cargo to Earth, whether it's returning time-sensitive experiments from the ISS or bringing back science performed inside the spacecraft while on orbit, Dragon safely returns it home. While docked with the ISS, Dragon can also act as a lab, providing extra room for astronauts to perform their work. And when the ISS is fully booked, Dragon even serves as an extra bedroom when necessary. In fact, NASA astronaut Mike Hopkins, as you see there, <laughs> adding his name, uh, his signature to the patch, commander of the Crew-1 mission, he slept inside Dragon Resilience during his entire six-month stay aboard the station. Look at that view. Imagine having that every night from Dragon's cockpit right before bed. Dragon can also serve as a laboratory while orbiting the Earth. During the Inspiration4 mission in 2021, which was the world's first all-civilian mission to orbit, the crew conducted research while traveling weightless at over 17,000 mi 17, miles per hour. On the Inspiration4 mission, Crew Dragon's cargo capacity was allocated for both crew essentials as well as scientific experiment equipment ex dedicated to microgravity research and experiments. And the Dragon research continues long after Dragon splashes down. The data and biological samples collected from Inspiration 4's crew members before, during, and after the mission, that will all be accessible through an open data repository of, or biobank, and that can be accessed for research purposes. While Dragon is responsible for delivering sensitive research and samples, that's just part of the story. For this mission, Dragon is also carrying something for the right-brained hemisphere uh, of the brain. <laughs> yeah, I love that, Kate. You know, it's really easy for us to make this connection between STEM and spaceflight. But over the last few years, we've been seeing a shift, right, between from just STEM to also STEAM. And that includes the arts. We're putting more emphasis on those things that are so human. So today's teachers, you know, they have to teach the values of both the importance of arts and engineering, because arts will always have a place in space. It's an essential element of culture, an essential element of exploration. Absolutely. So Correct. for this mission... SpaceX, for your awareness, closeout team has departed the crew arm. SpaceX, Dragon, we copy. And with that, Dragon, I've got a post-ingress brief for you. Report ready to copy. Ready to copy. Okay, Dragon, we are officially through the hurry up phase, and now we have a little bit of time to wait. Clock is at T minus 113 and counting. Dragon and Falcon systems continue to look healthy, and vehicles are ready for a launch attempt today. Weather continues to look great, and we'll keep you updated if anything changes. How copy so far? Very pleased to copy all so far, Jake. Okay, I do have one item for you looking ahead in the timeline to the first Dragon Burn on orbit. That's the phase burn at 2233 Zulu. I have some info uh, you might want to record. Report ready to copy. Ready to copy. Okay, for your awareness, we have a TDRS gap starting at 2225, that's 11 minutes before the phase burn, and it ends at the same time the burn ends, that's 2242. The impact is that we in Hawthorne will not have live data or comms during the burn. That said, 
Pending successful on-orbit Draco checkouts, we will be taking the burn and will rely on onboard vehicle automation to halt the burn if necessary. After the burn, we'll get a data dump and catch back up with the vehicle. It's not unprecedented in our flight history to not have data during the burn, but I'm letting you know. How copy? Okay, give us a minute here, Jake. Sure thing, and let me know if you'd like any of that repeated. Hey Jake, we all um, copied the uh, what you've read. I, I think the only question is we had a little confusion on your math, so maybe it's our math. But the burn start is 22:33. The LOS is 22:25 to 22:42. I thought you said 11 minutes, but either way, we'll come AOS around the end of the burn. You guys will get the data, and then we'll talk about any deltas, correct? Okay, I understand the confusion. I called burn start 2233. It is actually 2236. That's my mistake. And uh, explains the 11 minute gap then between 25 and 36. Yep, all clear now. Thanks. Okay, that's all I had. Uh, any questions from the crew here for the team in Hawthorne? No questions. Copy all. All right, so that was the post-ingress uh, crew briefing. That's the opportunity for SpaceX Core, which is the crew operations and resource engineer, to relay any important information to the crew, as you see seated inside Dragon Freedom. Um, we do this every launch, and that was actually a great example of why we do this and like the structure of those briefs and communication. Uh, so- RP-1 bleed has started. Jake Vendel. Uh, the SpaceX core today basically was saying really good news. Everything is looking healthy on both vehicles, Falcon 9 and Dragon, and the weather looks great. Like, that is music to our ears on launch day. He also gave the crew an update on the timeline regarding an expected loss of signal right around one of the right around the phase burn, which is one of the burns that Dragon performs in order to reach the International Space Station. Um, and you heard him say, you heard core say how copy, and then crew basically processed that information and said, wait a minute, we have a question, and a, and so. So I thought that was a really good example of why we do uh, what we do whenever we have these back and forths, because sometimes something gets uh, misread or uh, something is not understood. And it's absolutely critical that we have clear communication to make sure that everybody is on the same page and is expected. So all in all, really good uh, post ingress brief. Uh, like I said, all music to our ears. So everything is looking good for our, um, our liftoff in just under uh, one hour. And uh, it, let's see, we're looking at one hour, eight minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> That's a perfect recap, Kate. You know, for something like that, that really emphasizes how we're going to get into the future together, into low Earth orbit and beyond, right? So for Axiom Space, our future is Axiom Station. In the last few years, our team has grown from a few hundred engineers to now over a thousand. Our designs have gone from concept to mock-ups to the machining of flight hardware. So here's how our future is taking shape. There's sort of two philosophies in aerospace. One is you sit around and you think about requirements and you think about what you want to build. Or you build something, you test it, you figure out what works, you build another generation. We really believe at Axiom Space, the path to building something that doesn't exist in the world is you've got to start building prototypes. We sit and think about what we want to build for a little bit, but then we just go build the thing, test the thing, fire the engine. Our role really is to, to lead the way. A year ago, walking into this facility, you didn't see nearly as much hardware as you see today. 
full-scale mock-ups, training hardware, flight hardware. Axiom was created to build a space station, and that, that's exactly what this team is doing. We're still on target to launch our first module, the end of 26. The pressure vessel is undergoing welding at Talisalania, our partner in Italy. They're some of the largest forgings in the world. There's only a couple places in Europe that could even forge some of the pieces. The pressure vessel will arrive in Houston, and then we'll do all the final outfitting at our spaceport facility. And in the 50-year history of, of human spaceflight in, in Houston, it will be the first human-rated spacecraft ever built in Houston. Our teams are building all the other things. The life support system, the guidance and navigation, we're building our own propulsion system. Our philosophy is to keep as much engineering in-house as possible. It allows us to have long expertise over a long time because we want to be building modules and adding to our space station for years and years. Through our station, we will open up low Earth orbit to the world to explore, to travel, to complete science in space and beyond. Microgravity represents this enormous natural resource. And we think there are things that we can do there that lead to medical breakthroughs, material breakthroughs, and leads to a better world for everyone. It's the ability to produce uh, the highest quality of parts, materials, biological media, an environment that is nearly pristine. Behind this is uh, the Earth Observatory. We will fly it as part of the third module that goes to the International Space Station. And then the International Space Station robot arm will actually move it and position it underneath HAV-1. So it will have this fantastic view of the Earth through the largest space windows ever attempted. This is as close as you can get to actually doing an EVA in space. We talk about the overview effect where a cruise come back and see the world in a different sense than they did before. And I think this is where you can really contemplate that whole experience. AX3 is one of those learning opportunities for a multinational crew to work together in space. This is exactly how we envision Axiom Station to operate, where you have people from all over the world experiencing life as a community in space. Every morning when I walk into this building, I'm inspired by the work this team is completing. It's just a wonderful feeling seeing so many people excited about the prospect of launching the first commercial space station. If we're going to make a sustainable presence outside of the Earth biome, this is how we have to do it. Axiom Space is a continuation of a human need to explore and to move humans into the cosmos. For those of you that have recently tuned into our webcast, we are now one hour, three minutes, and 45 seconds away from the launch of the Axiom 3 crew to the International Space Station. Joining us now from ISS Flight Control Room at NASA's Johnson Space Center is Courtney Beasley. Welcome, Courtney. Hi, Kate and John. I'm happy to be joining you guys today, and we were, are looking forward to launch from Mission Control Houston. Courtney, we're so happy to have you guys here today. We're happy to be together in this room and talk about this crew. Uh, AX3 is the first, you know, all European crew. This is a historic flight for them. It's a historic flight for Axiom and NASA and SpaceX. You know, this is an incredible group. They've worked diligently, both individually and together, to get to this moment. Um, they're representing, across the four of them, five different nations. Yeah. Like, as you mentioned, they've trained extensively as a team, but now they're ready to be a part of that effective and contributing ISS team. Yeah, um, as we mentioned before, Michael Lopez Alegria is the first repeat flyer in mm -hmm. the Dragon program history, which... SpaceX Dragon for cabin temp.
Dragon SpaceX, I think that was for Cabin Fan. Go ahead. Actually, Jake, it was for Cabin Temp, and we're feeling just a little bit on the cool side here, wondering what the options are for warming it up. Copy, understood. We'll take a look at it. Thank you. All right, some quick back and forth mm -hmm. there with the crew and SpaceX Core, basically just asking to <clears throat> if there's any options to warm up the cabin. They're, yeah. they're a little cool. Um, as I was saying, MLA, our commander today, he is our first repeat flyer in the pro and then the history of the Dragon program, which I guess means that we have to make a frequent flyer member uh, yeah. club of some yeah. sort. <laughs> I think they give him a punch card for this, and he's no stranger to Dragon, as we're going to look at now. So the voice you heard there, like Kate just mentioned, Michael Lopez Alegria, or MLA, who is no stranger to human spaceflight. He's actually a dual citizen of the United States and Spain, and AX-3 marks his sixth mission to space, having completed three space shuttle flights and a Soyuz mission as a NASA astronaut, prior to commanding AX-1 with Axiom Space. MLA holds the NASA record for both the total number of spacewalks and the cumulative amount of time spent conducting spacewalks. In 2020, he was inducted into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame, and today, when he's not in low Earth orbit, MLA serves as Axiom Space's chief astronaut. Our pilot on today's flight, Walter Villaday, is from the Italian Air Force and is taking his inaugural, inaugural trip to low Earth orbit. Villaday currently serves in the Italian Air Force and as head of the Italian Air Force's representative office in the United States. He has completed cosmonaut training as a space engineer, participated in multiple uh, analog Dragon training. SpaceX. For a different topic, we are about to send a command to cycle the orbit tank ISO valves to equalize low flow pressure. You should hear it. How copy? Can we copy? We're standing by. All right, just notification there to the and crew. Dragon, I've got an update on the cabin temp, and it's not necessarily favorable. The there's not much we can do uh, at this point from the ground, uh, especially anticipating the heating that we'll incur during ascent. Uh, I'd like to assess if this is something you think you can ride out for another hour here. Absolutely, Jake. Just wanted to ask, but we understand what the priority is here. Copy, Dragon. Yeah, appreciate you asking. Sorry we can't do more in this situation. Uh, back to Walter. He has completed cosmonaut training as a space engineer, participated in multiple analog training missions, and flown a variety of aircraft and missions as an active flight engineer in the Italian Air Force. This mission is significant for Italy in that it commemorates the 100th year since the founding of the Italian Air Force. Now, our third crew member for today's mission is mission specialist Alper Izarache. Through this mission, Alper becomes the first Turkish astronaut to go to space. With 15 years of experience across a myriad of aircraft for the Turkish Air Force, Yuzarache got his start in the Air Force Academy in Istanbul, Turkey, and earned a master's degree from the U.S. Air Force Institute of Technology. He then flew as a commercial airline captain for several years before returning to duty in the Turkish Air Force. This mission also marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Republic of Turkey. And finally, we have Mission Specialist Marcus Want, a lieutenant colonel in the Swedish Air Force who flew nine years as a fighter pilot and graduated from the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School at the top of his class. In November of 2022, Marcus was selected by the European Space Agency as an astronaut reserve. However, with this mission, AX-3, he becomes the first project astronaut in ESA's history, a new designation within their ranks. In just a few short hours, he'll be only the second ESA astronaut of Swedish nationality to ever go to the International Space Station, a milestone marked in a year of jubilee as the five, 500th anniversary of the founding of the country of Sweden. So that is the AX-3 crew. Uh, we are now under an hour until liftoff. We're at T minus 58 minutes and 10 seconds, um, and they're gonna be heading to the International Space Station. All right, and with that, let's check in with NASA's Courtney Beasley.
Thanks, Kate. I'm here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room at NASA, NASA's Johnson Space Center, where teams staff this room around the clock to monitor the crew and systems aboard the orbiting laboratory. And today, they're ensuring that the station is ready to receive Dragon and the AX-3 crew. Since NASA opened up the space station for commercial activity in 2019, the agency has continued to work with private industry to prepare for the future of low Earth orbit. Now, last, NASA's long-term goal is to no longer be a provider of low Earth orbit destination, but to be a customer, one of many, purchasing commercially owned and operated services. To ensure this path of tomorrow, we have to work together today. Enabling private astronaut missions on board the space station helps us to refine and mature the processes needed for the future, with NASA astronauts working side by side with private and national astronauts in a new age of science and discovery. And we take this next step together as we continue continue counting down to launch the AX-3 crew to the International Space Station. Now, it's an incredibly busy time in low Earth orbit and beyond, and NASA wants to scout the moon before returning astronauts. So next month, it will send several science experiments aboard Intuitive Machine's Nova Sea Lander, which will launch on a Falcon 9 rocket. NASA is working with several American companies to deliver science and technology instruments to the moon through CLIPS, the agency's commercial lunar payload services initiative. One of the companies is Intuitive Machines, which developed and built the Nova Sea Lander. Nova Sea has six NASA experiments studying things like how sunlight charges the lunar atmosphere and how dust and gas particles will be affected by the spacecraft's landing on the moon's south pole. Its arrival on the moon would be the first robotic landing for the U.S. since the end of the Apollo program in 1972. CLIPS will help NASA understand the moon's environment and available resources ahead of crewed Artemis missions. The program will land the first woman and the first person of color on the lunar surface and then eventually send astronauts to Mars. That's your Artemis Moon Minute. Nova Sea is expected to touch down on the moon next month, and you can watch live coverage of the historic landing on NASA TV and NASA Plus. Now let's check back in with John and Kate in Hawthorne. Thank you so much, Courtney. You know, it's such an exciting future we have to look forward to, and it doesn't really feel that far off. You know, every day behind us, all over the country, back in Houston, there's work happening to bring about this vision. Yeah, that's right. Even as we speak, SpaceX teams are preparing for our upcoming launch of the Intuitive Machines Nova Sea Lunar Lander, known as the IM-1 mission. This will be the first SpaceX-provided launch of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, a key part of NASA's Artemis lunar exploration efforts. And down at Starbase Texas, we're continuing to build, test, and fly Starship, the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed. It's a fully reusable transportation system that will transport transform how we access space because it's designed to carry a massive amount of cargo and large numbers of people to Earth, to Earth orbit, the Moon, Mars, and beyond. We completed two flight tests last year, one of them you see here on your screen now, and 2024 is lining up to see even more starships take flight. We're still in the testing phase, but things like flying rapidly, full system reuse, and on-orbit refilling will be key to building and staffing a viable moon base. And right now, we're gearing up for Test Flight 3, currently targeted for sometime in February. We're also building a second Starbase launch tower, which uh, visualization you see there, uh, and that will uh, further increase Starship's flight opportunities. And this is, I love this, this is so cool looking. <laughs> it's not that far <laughs> off in the future. Uh, with our Starship Human Landing System, or HLS, we're part of the global team with NASA and companies, including, including Axiom Space, that will put astronauts back on the moon under the Artemis program. First, we're going to fly, and fly often on flight tests, one of which will be an uncrewed mission all the way to the moon. This will take place before the crewed Artemis III mission, which will be the first human expedition of the moon surface since 1972. Also in testing, our engineers are proving out all systems necessary to make a trip to the moon possible, like propulsion, life support, even the elevator that you <laughs> see here that will take crew and cargo from the Starship hatch down to the lunar surface. It's literally a space elevator. <laughs> That's awesome, Kate. And in addition to the launch and landing capabilities that you just mentioned, another essential component of the Artemis program is a spacesuit that is capable of executing a wide array of mission objectives. A spacesuit really is a spaceship. It's just a little smaller and in human form. 
So, in order to develop a lunar spacesuit that meets all of the objectives for Artemis, Axiom Space is building the Axiom Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or Axiom U, Axiom U, back in Houston, Texas. Our next generation spacesuit is built to provide greater flexibility and mobility, allowing astronauts to work on the moon in ways that were not possible 50 years ago. We've also put a strong emphasis on modularity, meaning that the Axiom U suits will support a wide range of body sizes and types. From the hand-built soft goods to the life support, advanced avionics, and communication systems, this entire Axiom U system is built with integrity and care from head to toe. And I'm truly honored to say that I'm a small part of that amazing team. Leveraging years of this human spaceflight experience and partnering with numerous industry leaders, Axiom Space is ensuring that the Axiom U allows astronauts to succeed on Artemis and beyond. There's so much to look forward to with this groundswell of focus on the moon. It's just incredible that humans are finally going back to the moon and the efforts of SpaceX and Axiom get to play a vital role in that. I know, I love that we get to be a part of this in our generation, right? Like this is what commercialization of space looks like. It takes cooperation, it takes coordination and a lot of dedication. And AX3 is a critical step in demonstrating those core components. Absolutely. Now for those that have just recently joined, we are now about 51 and a half minutes away from launch. The clock continues to count down to the launch of AX3. So let's share some of the highlights, highlights of the day that got us to where we are now. Exactly, so crew wrapped up their quarantine phase, um, taking a flight from their quarantine facility at Kennedy over to Kennedy Space Center. You can see them there on the helicopter as they think about their flight and pass over the Cape. And what I think is really cool about this is they get to see their vehicle from, hip, from this perspective too as they come in, right? Yeah. And at this point, you know, they're gonna touch down, they're thinking about their mission, and then they get to wave to their families. They get to see, they haven't seen them in so long, they get to wave to them, have a final goodbye, and at this point, this is where we really hand over to SpaceX to complete the rest of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Man, look at those smiles. Everyone is excited, as they should be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so after they arrive and after they're handed over to the crew, um, they go through a series of events such as putting their suits on. Obviously, they take a ride up to, oh, here we can see there. Uh, this is the moment where they walked out of the Falcon support building. This is where our SpaceX suit up room is located. They stand here, do another wave. Um, <laughs> really, this was the first opportunity that we, we got to see the crew in their suits today got in those Teslas uh, and drove up to the launch pad, which is about roughly a half mile away from where those doors are. Um, I'm always curious what music they're listening to oh, yeah. um, during this ride. Uh, you can see here that they are pulling up to the launch pad, um, two Teslas. We have the crew split in half there with some closeout team members uh, that obviously help, help support them. We lovingly refer to them as the ninjas um, <laughs> because we see them all around assisting the crew in things like in getting into or ingressing the capsule. Um, so here, this is one of my favorite moments of launch day it, when they get to see their rocket up close um, and man, just thinking about the fire that's going to come out at the bottom there uh, in just under an hour. Yeah, and at this point you can see our commander and our pilot walking down as well as Marcus and Alper to their Dragon capsule before they get in. Yeah, so at this point in time that side hatch is closed. We had the post ingress crew briefing and we heard great news. We heard that the weather is looking good. I think the exact words were uh, weather is great and that everything is healthy. So both uh, Falcon 9 and Dragon vehicles are ready to go to space just like the crew. Excellent recap, Cape. All right, well, it's important to remember that this crew has not walked this path to flight alone. Earlier today, they waved to their friends and family before suiting up, as we just saw, but that wasn't the first round of cheers that their families had for them. To the whole crew of Axiom, mission number three. This is the SOG flight test team that would like to wish you a safe and fantastic journey up to the International Space Station. Hello from Turkey. Have a safe space flight. Good luck! Ciao, papa, buon viaggio! Siamo con te, amore! Siamo tanto orgogliosi di te, papa! Ti vogliamo bene! Ciao! Greetings, Commander Mike and AX3 crew from your ASTM family here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Your dedication to exploration and discovery inspires us all. Enjoy every second of it. Make us dream. We're all coming with you. Yolun açık olsun Alperim. Ed Astra. 
que acuérdate de saludarnos desde allá arriba, desde alguna de las ventanitas. Y nada, aquí estaremos esperándote con los brazos abiertos para cuando vuelvas. Un besito. Congratulations, Alper. We're excited for your opportunity to go into space. Have a good and prosperous time there and get back to Earth safely. Best of luck and have fun on this life-changing mission. Hey, AX3 crew. Listen, you guys are about to have a lot of fun. Be sure you get in the cupola a lot. Call home. Actually, call all your friends. And just be sure you tie your sleeping bag down well. I ended up somewhere else one day. It was a hoot. Anyway, have fun. Ad Astra. Enjoy. See you when you get back. Yeah, those are pretty wise words from John Schaffner there from uh, AX2. Uh, yeah, it's just so fun to see everybody's cheers. Uh, space really is for everyone, mm -hmm. um, including everyone that loves the people going to space. Hey, so. Dragon and operators on countdown. Polling is complete. Both Dragon and Falcon teams have pulled go for launch escape arm, propellant load, and launch. Stand by for abort instructions. Uh, T minus 45 minutes. Uh, both control rooms go into lockdown and remain in that state until the launchscape system is disarmed. All operators are to remain at their console and maintain a stroke cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming of the launchscape system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent, no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch Control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into launch abort. At T minus 10 seconds, Launch Control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fire is imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch Control at this time, you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Launch control copies proceeding with arming crew arm for movement. Well, there you heard it. We are go to proceed with propellant load in just under 10 minutes. Crew arm retract has started. And we are beginning to retract that crew access arm. Both the Falcon 9 and Dragon are go for launch. Wow, great view of that on your screen right now. Um, and in a moment, we should hear some additional directions from our launch director to the team. Now, of course, the crew is currently on board, again, with that great view of the crew access arm moving away from Dragon there at historic launch pad 39A. So now the range continues to be go for launch, and we're monitoring the clearance area around the launch pad, as well as air and sea space around the flight corridor. Even though we have been keeping an eye on some possible storm cells near the launch site, the conditions are predicted to be acceptable for launch. Downrange landing zones, if needed for an escape, are also go. Now, the full retraction of that crew access arm is expected to take about two minutes and will be followed almost immediately with the arming of the launch escape system. Crew arm retraction is complete. There is confirmation that that's complete. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Kate. Thanks, Ronnie. As we heard, the crew access arm is out of the, is now uh, moved out of the way. It is in its uh, launch configuration. This is one of the last physical changes to the pad that we will see prior to the liftoff of the AX3 crew. Uh, the next milestone that we have coming up will be arming of the launch escape Dragon system. SpaceX. With that, you are go for section six, close visors and arm launch escape system. SpaceX Dragon in work. 
All right, so right now the crew is activating the launch escape system. Um, They're using the tablets there, uh, the touch screen in front of them. Uh, this is the system is the first of its kind escape system. It provides the escape capability all the way to orbit. Uh, you know, it is our- SpaceX Dragon, visors closed, arming launch escape system. SpaceX copies. We take every measure possible to ensure the crew has options at all times, including an escape in the worst of scenarios. Um, it is our most solemn duty to make sure the crew gets home to their families. And we're here now seeing the, uh, the like we said, the crew is activating the launch escape system. If engaged, it would utilize the Super Draco engines, which are basically extra powerful versions of the Draco engines that Draco uses while on orbit. So uh, generally speaking, we don't want to activate the Super Dracos, but they're there in case if necessary. So launch escape, launch escape system arming is now underway, uh, but let's talk a little bit about the control rooms that we are launch operating. Launch escape system is verified armed. All right, there we heard the call out telling us that that launch escape system is now activated. So here, this is our mission control center in uh, here just behind us actually in uh, at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. We also have launch control um, at firing room four at Cape Canaveral. That team is responsible for monitoring Falcon 9 throughout the countdown and the launch. Uh, where, whereas here, mission control is responsible for close monitoring of the crew and Dragon every step of the way uh, as the spacecraft orbits the planet along its customized flight path. On console or uh, on headset, as we say, are a number of key positions who are monitoring the health of the vehicle and the crew. The mission director, call sign MD, as you'll hear uh, out on the nets, that person's responsible for mission success and is in charge of the room. You'll also hear a specific role dedicated to communicating to the AX3 crew. We've heard from this individual a couple of times already today. This is Jake Vendel today. Uh, this is the crew operations and resource engineer, call sign core on the nets. The other positions are focused on things like software, propulsion, navigation, avionics, life support systems, and ultimately communications with the ground segments. SpaceX team members will also rotate on and off to ensure that we have 24 seven coverage of crew and Dragon for the entire duration of the mission, all the way through splashdown. So fun fact, we also have a crew um, supporting the NASA Crew 7 team in a uh, uh, an adjacent control room okay. just next door to this one. Um, so yeah, we have 24 seven coverage for all Dragons up at the space station. That's awesome, Kate. And you know, on that note for Axiom Space, teams in Houston, as you can see there, coordinate mission support at Axiom Mission Control Center, or MCCA, as you can see on your screen. MCCA is an officially certified control center joining the large network of other control centers, like you just mentioned, Kate, uh, that support ISS from all over the world. From this secure facility, teams have live access to voice, video, data, all of that streaming from the ISS and can work alongside their NASA counterparts to run on-orbit preparations and monitor every aspect of the mission in real time, 24 seven, for the duration of the mission. Now, this room is led by what we call an AXEL, or Axiom Operations Lead. And around the room are also additional supporting flight controller positions that are each responsible for different aspects of mission support. That includes things like research, communications, medical, integration and stowage, and timeline operations. This is a significant step in our journey to expand access to low Earth orbit, as it is only the 12th ground segment partner for the ISS program. And through this facility, we are providing our customers and the global community a front row seat to the work being done on station. Yeah, as you can tell by the names like Core and Axel, these yeah. are really important roles and mm -hmm. everything else kind of flows around yeah. them as the center point in those, uh, leading those operations, whether it's on the Axiom side or the SpaceX side. So uh, as we await our T0 in just under 39 minutes from now, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure both the Dragon and Falcon are ready for launch. Let's take a look at what the ascent portion of today's mission will look like. Once we hit T minus zero, we'll watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A, which you have a great view of right now, and begin to make their ascent. At about 43 seconds into flight, Falcon 9's engines will throttle down to help us pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. It's worth noting that once we hit max Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic or faster than the speed of sound. 
Once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that happen in rapid succession. First is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin engines shut off in preparation for stage separation. Stage separation is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth for landing as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event. That second engine start one, or SES one, where the Merlin vacuum engine on board stage Expect two. cloud venting from the vehicle in 30 seconds. Where the engine on stage two lights up and propels the second stage, along with our AX3 crew and Dragon into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute three burns in order to make its way back to Earth. The first is the boost back burn, where three of the Merlin 1D engines will reignite and shut down. This heads the first stage back to Cape, back to Cape Canaveral. The second burn, or the entry burn, helps slow the stage down in preparation. Falcon 9 tanks are venting for the starter propellant load. Second burn or entry burn helps to slow the stage down in preparation for that entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. And about 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn will bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land back on land near the launch site um, about eight minutes into the mission. And while that first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. Then, Dragon will begin preparations to separate from the second stage. About three minutes after the second stage reaches orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from stage two. Once Dragon is, sh is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. The nose cone deploy sequence will initiate just before T plus 12 minutes and then finish around T plus 15 minutes. This will expose Dragon's docking mecha mechanism in advance of its arrival at the International Space Station. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the training that the crew has gone through in order to be ready for this mission. Altogether, the Axiom 3 mission crew spent about 35 days training inside Dragon, and crew members individually received additional training specific to their role, learning SpaceX protocols, ISS systems, and preparing for the science and outreach activities that they'll be conducting while in space. Private astronaut training is rigorous. To prepare the AX3 crew for their mission, our teams here at SpaceX have spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics, how to live in microgravity, and running simulations of full missions from inside our Dragon training capsules. The training program includes nearly 100 different lessons covering all aspects of flight, 
And if you're thinking it's kind of hard to tell what's the true craning and what's the real capsule, that's true because yeah. they're, they're pretty much identical and that's the point. The team also spent time at the launch pad in the suit up room and working through emergency procedures that would be necessary in the unlikely event of a pad abort scenario. So let's take a further look at this crew in action. Exactly. The crew spent extensive amounts of training time in historic Building 9 at the Johnson Space Center, learning from certified instructors on all critical systems necessary to ensure a successful stay aboard the orbiting laboratory. The team even prepared for unlikely emergencies, like you mentioned, Kate, and learned how to provide first aid in a microgravity environment. Additionally, they learned how to prepare food and make selections for their meals, as well as how to, as learning other mission control um, positions and how mission control operates to better ensure that mission success during their flight. They also had a chance to familiarize themselves with the gear that will enable them to document their trip, their research, and help them connect with those back on Earth during their outreach events. ESA and JAXA also played a critical role in cruise training. Each module on orbit has its own nuances, so gaining insight into the specialties of their racks and modules is necessary, especially for this mission. Extensive training on station navigation, on-orbit familiarization, emergency response, and repetition of walking through processes and procedures all help the crew maximize every second that they have during their flight. Simulating science research, operations, and even discussing how to sleep in space are all necessary lessons on the path to mission readiness. Now, the National Outdoor Leadership School, or NOLS, provides very unique Earth-based experience for many astronauts before they fly. This is a really a bonding experience for the crew. It can't be overstated how much teamwork factors into every aspect of their flight together. And this training in particular aims to thoroughly establish that. They also focus on survival skills, resilience, leadership, equally as important as followership, and overall teamwork to ensure they really are more than just passengers on the same rocket. The camping and outdoor adventure provides a solid foundation for the team to build on throughout their training. Knowles was definitely a highlight of this crew's preparation and training, and you can hear it in their voices and see it on their faces when they talk about their bond with each other. Now, you can't truly experience flying into space until you fly into space. <laughs> but some really unique tools have been developed to provide the closest experience possible. An altitude chamber can challenge the body with oxygen deprivation in a controlled and safe manner, while human-sized helium load has started. While human-sized centrifuges send the crew members for a spin to simulate the g-forces that they'll experience on launch and re-entry. It can be a bit nauseating, but it does help the crew know exactly what to expect on launch day. Now, at the end of it all, a mission patch is celebrated and it is hung in a tradition since the earliest days of spaceflight. So fittingly, as AX3 heads to the International Space Station, the crew had the chance to be present for the patch hanging ceremony of their mission patch in Building 9 on that module in Johnson Space Center. Spaceflight is a serious business, but moments of levity and celebration like this help everyone pause and reflect on the incredible accomplishments being achieved every day. No matter how many patches join a canvas like this one, each one is incredibly special because of the people who make it possible the crew, and those here on Earth supporting each mission. So now for more on each crew member's portfolio, we're going to send you out to the Kennedy Space Center with Sonia Gavankar McKay, the Axiom Space Director of Digital Strategy, who is joined by Axiom's Chief Scientist, Dr. Lucy Lowe. Building on the success from AX1 and 2, now 3 has over 30 experiments and some of them returning customers. Lucy, good to have you back. This is one of my favorite parts of the pre-launch broadcast because we get to talk about all the science that's happening. There's so much happening. It's over 350 hours of research, Absolutely. which is great. But do we think like this This is going to help us here on Earth? Does it really? Absolutely. So everything the crew is doing, it has huge benefits, not only for space flight and advancing exploration goals for humanity, but a lot of the research they're doing is really based on benefiting humans down here on Earth, whether it's healthcare, medicine, different kinds of technology applications. Everything they're doing has really tangible benefits to science and technology back down here on Earth. If you had to summarize each of the country's portfolios, how would you do that? Italy. Give me some Italy, words. Italy. They are doing some fantastic technical applications for the Italian Air Force mm -hmm. uh, and they are doing uh, some really advanced biomedical research as well with some uh, of their companies that they're working with. Excellent. Turkey, it's all about bringing all of Turkey together. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. Turkey has a truly national portfolio. They have everyone across the country getting involved uh, from researchers at universities all the way down to school children. ESA and Sweden, what's their portfolio looking like? ESA has a very strong focus on uh, research for advancing technology for exploration. So they have lots and lots of really cool technology demonstrations that are going to help human exploration in space in future. And tech demos as well. Is, do, you, do you as chief scientist, is that 
tech demos a different thing or is it then research or all part of the same wonderful pot? They're very much part of the same pot. So all the technology demonstrations that take place are built on a lot of research and they often feed into future research that will take place to keep crew safe or to benefit human health here on Earth. Okay, so let's dig in a little bit deep, deeper, starting with Italy. They have the ISOC services for the ISS. Tell me a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so this is a project from the Italian Air Force, which is the Italian Space Operations Center where mm -hmm. they've developed some software that's actually going to be analyzed debris in space. Which is a huge problem. It's a huge problem. We need to know where stuff is going and stuff is flying so that we can make sure that the space station is out of the way of those kinds of impacts. So that software is also going to be doing some space weather forecasting to help keep crew safe in future. Space weather forecasting? Yes. Looking at different kinds of space weather from solar flares, for mm. example, that can actually release damaging radiation that can not only damage human cells, but can also damage the electronics in a spacecraft. So you want to avoid that when you can. Makes sense. Beta amyloids aggregation updated yes. this is and this is about alzheimer's Exactly, research. exactly. So beta amyloid is a protein that aggregates together. It forms clumps, it forms amyloid plaques that are found in the brains of humans with Alzheimer's. Mm. If we can understand how those aggregates form better, which we can use microgravity to really investigate that, then we can gain insights into the Alzheimer's disease and how this terrible neurodegenerative disease can form or potentially how we could even treat it. And you talked about that weather forecasting, which is part of radiation. That's a big part. So briefly tell me about the Italian portfolio with, with radi radiation research. Exactly. So they have got some uh, light ion detector soft, uh, hardware that they have uh, built that is going to be uh, analyzing the real-time radiation risk from this kind of space weather. And we also have some companies that have got some advanced materials that they've developed that is uh, designed to shield from some of this radiation in future. Okay, let's talk about the country of Turkey's research portfolio, the Turkish Space Agency, otherwise known as TUA. They have 70 types of diseases that they're going to be researching with AI technology? Yes, so they have a really cool project called Vocal Cord, okay. which has developed, uh, it's an easy to use telemedicine application where the crew actually cough or speak or make vocal noises into an iPad for recordings and the AI software is then actually able to analyze that and can be used to detect or diagnose infectious diseases infectious diseases, uh, potentially even cardiovascular diseases in future. Wow. Very cool. Partnerships are a big deal with Axiom Space. All of these countries are partners with us, and Turkey is working with JAXA on one of their research projects. Tell me about that one. Exactly. So they're working on a very cool project using the JAXA's electromagnetic levitating facility, where they are melting and then re-solidifying some metal alloys in a way that the, the metal alloy floats in space, wow. so which helps us understand more about the molecular structure of these alloys and helps us understand understand more about materials research, that we can then take that knowledge and apply that to industry back down here on Earth. And ESA and Sweden looking way into the future. Their research is focused on humans in long-term space situations. Tell me about their research projects. Exactly. So one of their projects is called Orbital Architecture, which is a really fun one. They're investigating what the effect of the uh, very busy and crowded environment of the International Space Station is, not only on crew uh, cognitive function, but also on the crew's stress responses uh, and also their neural responses. So yes, as you can see, that the ISS is, is very, very busy. Up we there. were talking about that. It's, it <laughs> seems very crowded. It's very crowded. So this investigation is going to be understanding in different parts of the space station, for example, if you look out the window, if your stress response goes down, do you then perform better in space? And how can we then apply those technologies, not only for future space flight, but also for engineering and building design back down here on Earth? There's also a great one on Simon. Now, my question is, Simon, is it more like HAL or TARS? So, it's uh, a bit more like TARS, okay, because, good. because okay. I'm a big fan of the Martian. But, uh, yeah, so Simon is the crew interactive mobile companion. Here he is flying through space. So, uh, this is an AI-guided tool that is free flying on station that can help crew with tasks while they're up there. So, it's actually going to be helping Marcus do a physical sciences investigation for ESA while he's up on station. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lucy. And I look forward to hearing about the post experience and post-mission research findings. Thank you so much. Always fascinating. Back to you all at Hawthorne. John, how's it going out there? It's going great, Sonia. Thank you very much for that. You know, hearing all that different research really kind of cements how important and unique each mission yeah. is, right? Each mission has its own suite of research. It has its own crew that makes up that mission. And mission patches really are a way of showing that symbolism and showing how unique that is, right? So they end up everywhere. There's one in that Dragon Capsule. There's a few in that Dragon Capsule now, I think, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but they end up in white rooms. They end up on orbit. They end up um, on laptops and notebooks. It's a very big deal for crew to be central in helping design this patch because it's such a lasting mark of their dedication and hard work. 
and the AX3 crew has put their mark on spaceflight history with the AX3 mission patch. All four astronauts are highlighted by their names, a star, and unique graphics for each nation that they represent. With the commander, Michael Lopez Alegria, holding dual citizenship, five national flags mark the top edge. The destination, the International Space Station, is the anchoring element in the middle. And interesting to note, the ISS resembles pilot's wings. So it should be no surprise, given that all four members are indeed pilots. Along the bottom of the patch, we see the mission's motto, the phrase plus ultra, in Latin meaning further beyond. So together, all of this builds on the mission's theme of exploration and its slogan, exploring further without borders. Yeah, like you said, they do end up everywhere. My personal favorite place is there inside the capsule. Um, there's two patches in there, one from the Crew-4 mission and one, of course, from the AX-2 mission, which also mm. took this capsule to space. So um, I think it's safe to say that we're going to be flying so much that we are going to potentially <laughs> run out of space for patches. <laughs> we'll put them on the back of the seats, some, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now the SpaceX teams have uh, teams all across, or SpaceX has teams all across the country supporting our missions in key roles, uh, and they're lo and they're in key locations such as our mission director, our core or crew operations and resource engineer, which you see there on your screen now, um, and and these people are very important. Um, we we keep talking about the countdown, and this launch countdown is the framework that syncs all of these teams up together. It's incredibly important. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We've heard a lot of that today, right? As we're talking, we're hearing these, these loops or nets, right? Of, every, of all these flight controllers talking, that's because communication is key. The entire mission from launch, on orbit, all the way back down to splashdown is a tightly choreographed dance between all of those parties. And that's where communication comes in. For sure. It's pre uh, precise communication specifically is paramount throughout the mission in order to be successful, not just for today and on the way to the station, but continually for the next two weeks all the way through splashdown. Like I mentioned before, we have a, 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 another team supporting the capsule that's on station for mm -hmm. Crew-7. So yeah, it's all the way through until the mission is complete. Exactly. And highlighting that communication, you see those two teams just on your screen there. Those are two of the many that work together. So to help facilitate that calm, Axiom Space is connected with that entire network of participants through MCCA in Houston, our mission control center at Axiom headquarters. That's what you see on the right there. And from SpaceX, NASA, and other international space agencies and researchers, we can talk together. So their teams monitoring and participating in this mission around the world, including mission controllers in Japan and across Europe. When you all add it up, it really is a truly international endeavor. Yeah. Now, speaking of international, let's check back in with International Space Station Mission Control Center at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Courtney, how are things looking over there? Hey, Kate. The space station team here in Houston is focused on the critical systems on the station, all continuing to function as expected ahead of launch. The teams have verified the command path from the ground up through our constellation of communication satellites to the station, and everything is looking good, and the station will be ready to receive Dragon Saturday morning. Now, once the AX-3 crew arrives at the station, there will officially be seven nations aboard the station. They will be greeted by the expedition. Edition 70 crew, NASA astronauts Andy Mogensen, Jasmine McBelly, and Laura O'Hara, Roscosmos cosmonauts Konstantin Borisov, Oleg Kononyenko, and Nikolai Chub, and JAXA astronaut Satoshi Furukawa. And once Dragon is fully docked to the station, the team here in Houston will assist the Axiom Space and Space Station astronauts with leak checks as they work to open hatches on both the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place approximately two hours after docking. Flight directors Diane Daly and Diana Trujillo are on console now. Leading flight controllers for launch and flight director Judd Freeling will lead teams for docking on Saturday. Mission Control in Houston is go for launch. Now with that, let's connect with Sonia at Kennedy Space Center.
All right, for those of you that have recently tuned in, we are now within 20 minutes until the launch of AX3 to the International Space Station. Officially, T minus 18 minutes on the dot. Uh, we've had a pretty clean countdown so far today. As I mentioned before, this launch countdown is the framework that syncs everybody together. We have teams in Houston, here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, um, uh, of course, at the Cape itself, um, firing room four, and everything is proceeding nominally. Uh, the reports that we heard earlier during the post-crew uh, ingress uh, briefing was that the weather was great, although we can see here on our screen a little cloudy, but we see some blue skies through there, so love to see that. We also heard that the team was working no major issues. Both Falcon and Dragon remained healthy. At uh, T minus, I believe it was 35 minutes. Yeah, T minus 35 minutes, we began prop load or propellant loading. Um, we now see some of these white clouds billowing from the vehicle. This is totally normal during this propellant load phase. Uh, we are currently loading our super chilled, uh, also known as densified liquid oxygen excuse me, liquid oxygen onto the vehicle as well as rocket grade kerosene or RP-1. We will continue to see these clouds kind of forming um, and we'll get even more of them right um, after the those uh, closeout lines complete at T minus three and two minutes when both the first and second stages complete all of its propellant loading. Like I said, everything continues to look great. The crew is currently strapped into their seats. There's a five-point safety harness. You can think of it like a seatbelt, but it's a little bit more advanced than that. Actually, we see a live view of the crew there waiting so patiently <laughs> as we are getting... All right, so there we heard that call out that stage two locks load has initiated. That is that super chilled liquid oxygen being loaded onto the Falcon 9 second stage, which of course is the part of the rocket just below that black and white trunk section that we see there on screen. So the crew, um, we there uh, at this particular view, the person on the far left is Marcus Want, one of our mission specialists. To his right is pilot Walter Vilade. To his right is Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, or MLA, and on the very far right, Mission Specialist Alper Izarauche. Um, fun fact for today's flight, it is the first time that we have a repeat flyer on Dragon. That's at Commander MLA, he flew on the Axiom 1 mission, and uh, it's so exciting to see him flying once again in Dragon today. He's pretty much an expert at this point. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for that update, Kate. And now for an update from Sonia Gavankar McKay at Kennedy Space Center with Deputy Administrator, Deputy Administrator Bill Nelson. Thanks so much, John. I'm now joined by NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Thank you so much for joining us. This is, we're so, so very close. NASA has so many decades worth of great relationships in the private sector with the commercial sector. Is this a winning strategy for the future? I know NASA is looking now further than LEO into the, going to the moon and even further. What does this look like going further and what are we building on? It's the new era of the golden age of space adventurism. Uh, we go back to the moon, for example, not only with our commercial partners, and you know, the two landers will be built by commercial uh, companies, but we also go back to the moon with our international partners. Right. And that's quite uh, a difference from a half century ago when we first went to the moon. And that's the way that our space flight is in low Earth orbit as well. Look at the international cooperation on the space station. Look at now the commercial operation on the space station as evidenced by this flight here today. This moment really is that culmination of that international partnership, private, commercial, all of these things building on each other. How important is this for NASA to develop these commercial partnerships and, and across varying fields? I mean, Axiom Space, of course, building the Axiom Station. We're working on the suits that'll be worn uh, on the moon by the Artemis crew. How important are these partnerships for NASA? Well, it's essential. We want to get out of low Earth orbit. We want to go and explore the cosmos. Uh, and so the more that we can bring commercial business off the face of the earth up to low earth orbit and, for example, 
replace the International Space Station when it ages out in 2030 with a commercial space station that then we can become a person who rents space right. to train our astronauts before we send them out to the moon oh. and on to Mars. Uh, or the business aspect, pharmaceutical research, pharmaceutical production, uh, all kinds of different research utilizing the properties of microgravity in space. So you're seeing the Axiom Station as an expansion of the the area that is available to do this work and this dynamic shift between NASA and organizations like Axiom Space really offers something new to the landscape. This really is the, the next golden age, isn't it? Well, and Axiom is one of several that are now uh, with incentive money from NASA building their concepts of a space station for low Earth orbit. And I am certainly hopeful that they are going to be successful and that increasingly as they do research in space, they're finding out that there's a business case yes. in order that they can actually have a profitable business. Well, that's what we're looking forward to. And we're looking forward to just this great moment as we build these partnerships, these relationships. Thank you so much for, for having us here and for being part of this broadcast and sharing this wonderful moment for all of our organizations, SpaceX, Axiom Space, NASA, working together as usual, right? Thank you so much. Thanks so, so much, Senator. Thanks for joining us. As go we, AX3. Go AX3, that's right. As we charge towards Terminal Countdown to launch, Michael Lopez Alegria, today's commander, has a special message for for his crew, let's take a look. Man, I am excited. We are getting very close. As we get to these last few minutes, I wanna make sure I take a second to thank the training teams that got us here that prepared this very professional team of astronauts to go to the International Space Station on this very historic mission. First, the NASA teams, both at Johnson Space Center in Houston and at Marshall in Huntsville, Alabama. Then to our international partners, ESA at the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, Germany, and SCUBA near Tokyo in Japan. Um, and the Axiom team, whose help really was important when it got down to training for all the payloads that we'll be doing, over 30 experiments, as I think you've heard. So we're excited and very thankful to all those guys, but last but not least, to the folks in whose very capable hands we find ourselves right now, that's SpaceX. Uh, thanks to everybody. Without you, we couldn't have been here. Now let's go do it. Great view of our AX3 crew there, strapped in and ready for liftoff just over 10 minutes from now. Dragon SpaceX, confirm crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon, the displays are so configured and uh, do you mind if I say a few words here, Jake? MLA, I do not mind at all. You've got the floor. So first, I want to thank uh, our partners who had the vision and the conviction to help Axiom open access to humans uh, to low Earth orbit, and they are the Italian Air Force and its various ministries of its government, the Space Technologies Research Institute of Turkey, Tubitak, and the Turkish Space Agency and its ministry, as well as the Swedish National Space Agency in tandem with ESA. And I also want to thank the team. If you're listening to this through an earpiece sitting in Hangar X and Launch Control or in Hawthorne and Mission Control, you're on the team. And the same is true of people who will be sitting at those consoles and consoles just like them and uh, Mission Control in Houston and the Payload Operations and Integration Center in Huntsville. Same is true for all the trainers that helped us get uh, where we are today with the crew ready to launch. And of course, the engineers, technicians, managers, and executives who over decades designed, assembled, and are now operating the most complex vehicle in the world that we have the privilege to go visit. Same is true for the visionaries who conceived and developed this amazing rocket that we're sitting on and the beautiful and capable capsule that we're sitting in. 
And if you're in the rescue ops center, you guys are on the team. And of course, so are our friends and families who have given us their love and support from the very first step of this journey. And last but not least, the team at Axiom Space, the people who have poured their blood, sweat, and tears into this. To the four of us that are lucky enough to man the good ship freedom at this point, are humbled to be on the team. We're grateful to our teammates, and we are go for launch. Plus Ultra. Copy all, Mike. As we just ticked through T minus eight minutes, I'll let you know you've got a whole bunch of people rooting for you here and indeed all over the world. Godspeed, Axiom 3. Some really nice words there coming to us from Commander Michael Lopez Alegria. Uh, we are now approaching seven minutes until liftoff of the AX3 crew. The next event that we'll hear is that stage one engine chill has begun. Engine chill has started. And just on time, that call out tells us that we are now flowing a little bit of the super chilled liquid oxygen through the engines, through those turbo pumps to help bring the temperature down of that hardware. This helps us to reduce any chance of thermal shock whenever the full flow of that super chilled liquid oxygen uh, flows into the engines. Lock load continues for Falcon 9. We are fully- Stage one, RP1 load is complete. So good call outs there that we have completed loading RP-1, which is a highly refined type of kerosene on board stage one of Falcon 9. You've got that great view on your screen. As we mentioned earlier, Falcon 9 is an RP-1 and liquid oxygen fueled vehicle. So LOX fueling continues on the vehicle on both the first and second stage. Blue skies there at the launch site. We're launching out of pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. We are 60% go for those weather conditions, which we're always keeping an eye on around the Florida um, airspace. Next event that we have coming up is the uh, terminal count for Dragon. This involves a, uh, a couple of things, but primarily just means that Dragon will be transitioning to uh, internal power. Great view there of the Dragon capsule, as well as the Dragon trunk, which is the unpressurized section just below the, the pressurized section, which of course is where we have the crew sitting. Propellant remains underway. We are completely loaded with all of our RP-1, that rocket grade uh, kerosene. We're still underway. Falcon 9 tanks are pressing for Stromback retract. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. So like Kate mentioned, we are heading into terminal count and Falcon 9 is ready for that configuration. We also just heard the call out that the Falcon 9 tanks are pressurized for strong back retraction. The strong back is that white structure you see to the right of the vehicle right now. That's used not only to connect the vehicle's umbilicals, but also as a structural support system. The strong back is retracting? Up until it begins to retract, which we just heard the call out for here. That's the mechanism we use both to move the rocket out to the launch side and pull it into its vertical orientation ahead of launch. We now can, we'll keep, we keep an eye on those. it as it retracts slightly here on your screen. We'll be able to see those clamp arms begin to open. And there they are now. And then that strong back will retract a couple degrees away. It will retract even further upon ignition of the engines to clear the way for Falcon 9's ascent. As I mentioned before, RP-1 is completely loaded onto the vehicle. We're still loading liquid oxygen onto the first and second stage. And obviously some happy cheers as the crowd is growing outside of Mission Control Hawthorne, as you see there on your screen. It's always awesome to have uh, an astronaut launch, but especially one during the day. <laughs> 
stage one locks load is complete. With that confirmation, we know that stage one is fully loaded. Team is thrilled to hear that news behind me. At liftoff stage one, combined between that RP1. Dragon is in terminal count and is on internal power. There is confirmation that Dragon is on internal power and headed into the final minutes of our countdown. As I was saying earlier at liftoff, Falcon 9 will be burning nearly 700 gallons of fuel per second. Great views there too of our crew inside Dragon, awaiting liftoff just over two minutes from now. We're now standing by for completion of locks load on the second stage. Just topping off. And there's that call out. And more cheers from our crowd here in at Hawthorne, California. Dragon is in auto idle. Confirmation there that Dragon is in auto idle. Wow, great view of 39A on your screen right there as we head toward launch. Gas close up and started, expect loud venting. Call out to our crew there that loud venting is expected. Falcon 9 is in startup. There's that confirmation. Dragon is in countdown. Confirmation that Falcon 9 is in startup and Dragon is in countdown, which means that the vehicles are now controlling the final seconds as we lead up to liftoff. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. And there's confirmation from our flight director. Go for launch. We are go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 15. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition, engine full power, and the stop. So action three. Stop the time. Take that range. Further beyond, opening the door for more to follow. Godspeed AX3. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Of course, if you are just joining us, this is the launch of the Axiom 3 launch to the International Space Station. Those incredible views on your screen, and there's our first shot of the AX-3 crew inside Dragon on Ascent. Now in just a few seconds here, we should hear the call out that Falcon Not 9... Power and telemetry. Stage one throttle down. There's that call out that Falcon 9's engines are throttling down to help us pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure during ascent. Max Q. There's that call out for max Q. Falcon 9 is supersonic. And that Falcon 9 is going faster than the speed of sound. Now at this point, we will begin to throttle Falcon 9's engines back Stage up. Stage one throttle up. There's that call out for mission control as well. As our AX3 crew continues on their way to space. We're now T plus one minute and 32 seconds into flight. The next event we have is MVAC chill, similar to what- MVAC we, chill underway. There's that call telling us that, again, we're flowing a little bit of that super chilled liquid oxygen. Stage one Bravo. Copy one Bravo. 
that call there was one of the abort mode callouts that uh, the crew is calling out as they are uh, making their ascent on Falcon 9. Now we're less than uh, 30 seconds or a few seconds away from four events that will happen in rapid succession. Main engine cutoff or MECO as it's there on the bottom of your screen, stage separation, ignition of the first stage engine, and the first stage's boost back burn. Stage one throttle down. That call telling us that the engines are beginning to thr throttle down. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. SpaceX Dragon Q up. Some loud, loud cheers here as we can see that the first, first and second stages have separated. A beautiful view there. The brighter light is the second stage under power of the MVAC engine. That first stage booster is now heading back toward the Florida coast. One thing I love about daylight launches is we're going to get some amazing views. We should be able to see the Space Coast come back into view as the first stage gets closer and closer to uh, landing zone one. Note that that first stage is actually still coasting to its apogee. So it's uh, about, as you can see there on your screen, 114, 115 uh, kilometers above the Earth's surface. And it's going to keep coasting for a little bit. Beautiful view there on the right-hand side of your screen of that stage MVAC one, engine. Stage back, shut down. All right, that boost back burn has concluded on the first stage. Everything looks nominal with the second stage uh, trajectory. Everything also looking Dragon, good. Dragon, SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Everything looking good on the first stage as well as we see those grid fins begin to deploy. SpaceX, Dragon, loud and clear. Now the next two major events we're tracking for the first stage, which right now is on the left-hand side of your screen, is going to be the entry burn at about T plus six and a half minutes, where we'll light three of Falcon 9's first stage, engi stage engines, followed shortly thereafter by the landing burn at T plus seven minutes and 32 seconds, which will be a single engine burn to bring us back to landing zone one at Kennedy Space Center. Great view there of our crew on board and you can, of course, always keep an eye on their telemetry down in the bottom, bottom corner of your screen. At this point, we should be just about a minute and a half away from that entry burn Dragon, start. SpaceX trajectory nominal. Good call outs there that we continue on a nominal trajectory with Dragon. SpaceX Dragon, we come. And acknowledgement from the crew. These are incredible views on your screen right here. Again, the left-hand side of your screen is stage one, making its way back to Florida. And stage two, you see that MVAC engine burning, taking our AX-3 crew to orbit. That entry burn we're waiting on here is going to be a relatively quick burn. And what we're doing with our first stage is effectively scrubbing off some of that velocity as we come in for landing. Dragon, SpaceX, trajectory nominal. That's a nominal trajectory for Dragon as we continue to orbit. Dragon, we copy. Again, confirmation from the crew. And we are expecting about two and a half more minutes from that second engine burn. Stage one entry burn startup. Stage one entry burn shutdown. As we heard the call out, that entry burn has concluded. The next burn will be the landing burn. 
As I mentioned before, we're heading back to landing zone one. We're going to come through the clouds right now. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Everything continues to look nominal for, SpaceX Dragon, we copy. for the second stage there on the right hand side of your screen. These views really are breathtaking. Uh, such clear, crisp views of both the first stage on the left and the second stage on the right. Right through with these clouds should be uh, our first view once again. There it is. Just like magic, we see landing zone one. <laughs> Crowds cheering here at SpaceX Mission Control Hawthorne as we tune in to see if we stick the landing. And if you couldn't tell by the loud cheers, we did. We did Stage stick. Two, FTS has saved. We did stick that landing. Falcon 9 has landed once again. But turning our attention back to the crew, as you see there, our next event is second engine cutoff, uh, or SECO, as it's referred to there at the bottom of your screen. Second stage will coast for a few minutes until Dragon is commanded to separate. A lot of the, just the energy here as SpaceX mission control is buzzing. You can hear commentary behind us. Right now, the crew is experiencing about three Gs. Uh, so, pretty much a roller coaster um, for those thrill seekers out there. Stage two is in terminal guidance. And we are about 20 seconds away from that second engine cutoff. MLA will know this, uh, this feeling very well, this experience of going from now almost four Gs to... Next Dragon Shannon. To... Uh, Copy Shannon. As another abort mode there being called out. Now standing by for a second engine cutoff. Invex shutdown. Dragon SpaceX, you're in an nominal orbit. There we heard those call outs of second engine shutdown and nominal orbital insertion. Launch escape system disarmed. And the disarming of our launch escape system. That of course means that our AX3 crew is getting their first experience here in microgravity. Right now, Dragon is performing a series of onboard checks to ensure that we're ready to begin actuating those Draco maneuvering thrusters on board the vehicle. Now, as we prepare for Dragon separation, we should have a great camera view here in just a couple of minutes. Oh, wow, and beautiful views of the Earth and our MVAC engine up there in orbit as well. Use there as we await that separation. Absolutely incredible images that we are getting back from up in space as we await dragon separation in just about a minute. More views there of our AX3 crew on board Dragon. We are now just about 30 seconds away from that anticipated Dragon separation. Starting to see the crew there play a little bit with the fact that they are operating in microgravity.
and a great shot of Mission Control here in our headquarters at Hawthorne, California. This camera view here is taking a look uh, at Dragon. What we're waiting for is nose cone deployment, among other things, which as Kate mentioned earlier, there we go. Dragon separation confirmed. As you can see, Dragon has separated from the second stage. A pretty cool view here looking up at the heat shield that will return the AX3 crew back to Earth in just about two weeks. So this is our first view of AX3 flying free. The next physical change that we will see uh, will be the deployment of the nose cone. That will take- Dragon, this is the uh, SpaceX uh, Falcon team. We want to congratulate, uh, congratulate you on a great ride to orbit. I think you're demonstrating the ultimate in reuse, a reused commander, a reused dragon, and a reused falcon. Or maybe flight experience is a better word. Enjoy space. And Axiom 3, you all versed. And uh, as I was saying, it's a team sport. Thank you, guys. And Axiom 3, this is your launch director here. Uh, Walter, Albert, and Marcus. Congrats, welcome to your first flight on Dragon. Uh, Mike, on the other hand, welcome to the Dragon Frequent Flyer Club. I imagine you'll have enough miles to qualify for platinum status after this flight. Godspeed, Axiom 3, cheers. Mark, thanks to you and your team, we're very grateful up here. So some back and forth between the AX3 crew as well as uh, AX3 Chief Engineer, Chief Engineer Bill Gerstenmayer, who, um, oh, I heard the ping. That is our first Quindar tone of AX3. Um, fun fact, uh, Bill Gerstenmayer was actually Chief Engineer on AX1, which is the mission that MLA was also commander of. So um, if you want to talk about reuse, <laughs> We also have some reuse on our side as well. Um, we also heard some nice words from launch director Mark Soltis. Uh, so just some really nice communication from both the Falcon team and the Dragon team to the AX3 crew. And with that, our AX3 crew is in orbit and on their way to the International Space Station. Obviously great views of the crew there. And now mission control, again, Space that's- SpaceX Dragon, Jake, any chance you could uh, encode one of the centerline cameras, we could watch the nose cone. The crew's getting right into it. I love it. Dragon, we copy on the request. And Dragon, we expect that will automatically happen in the state machine here imminently. So with that, we are going to throw it back over to... Hooks still traveling. Okay, we we'll stand by. Great views there of our crew, again, on their way to the International Space Station. And already getting right down to the business of operating Dragon. You can still see a huge number of our team gathered behind Mission Control. Dragon SpaceX, we see nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. And confirmation that we're getting nominal checkouts of those Draco thrusters on board Dragon. Got the check, and for your awareness, we have uh, visors open, crew are well, feeling well. Copy, great news. So for those of you that have just recently tuned in, AX3 is in space. The crew is experiencing their first taste of microgravity. Here is a view of our MVAC engine, which has been shut down. Um, the crew has actually separated away from the second stage, which is where that MVAC engine is located. 
We are standing by for nose cone deployment. This takes a few minutes to complete as there are two sets of hooks that uh, need to be opened independently of each other. Uh, by deploying the, the nose cone, we are able to expose the docking mechanism, which is of course what the crew will utilize um, or excuse me, what Dragon will utilize to autonomously dock with the International Space Station. Overall, it was a pretty smooth flight all the way through countdown to liftoff. We're now approaching uh, 17 and a half minutes into flight. Once again, the next milestone will be to deploy the nose cone. This is the basically the last physical change that Dragon will undergo in order to begin its journey. Well, not really begin, it's already on the way, but in order to be ready for its approach to the International Space Station. All right, so it's hard to see at the moment because the camera is still close to the hardware, but this is the nose cone opening. Slow and steady wins the race. Of course, when you're in space, every action has an opposite and equal reaction. So for uh, very good reasons, we don't just fling the thing open. It's very slow and steady. Again, this allows us to expose the docking mechanism the hardware that will be utilized to dock with the International Space Station. That hatch, which is the forward hatch, uh, will then be opened and that's how the crew will get in and out of Dragon while it is up at the space station for the next two weeks. So that side hatch, which is where we saw the crew, or um, technically they were already in by the time that we uh, started our broadcast, but the crew did ingress Dragon today uh, just a couple hours ago through that side hatch, that remains closed. That won't open again until they are safely back on Earth on our recovery ship. So this nose cone that we see here slowly being opened is basically uh, opening the first part of a multi-system door <laughs> for them to get in and out of the International Space Station. I mentioned before that that docking is autonomous. That means that Dragon does the steering itself. Um, our pilot, uh, Walter Villade, has uh, the training and the capability to take control if necessary. Uh, but nominally speaking, Dragon is, uh, flies on autopilot. It, it does the thinking and the calculation uh, itself. which at, in, at the end of the day is ultimately much safer uh, than human steering as uh, you know, there's more, um, that humans are prone to error because we are human. So that's a live view there of SpaceX Mission Control Center here at uh, SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. It is in the middle of our work day. So <laughs> uh, of course, many folks have returned to their positions, their desks, their, their job, and uh, they are continuing to do what we do best. And that's build spacecraft and uh, rockets and send people to space just like we have done today. So with that, uh, let's check in over with Courtney, who is standing by at the ISS Mission Control Center in, in Houston. Uh, Courtney, how are things looking over there? It's over to you. Hey, Kate, everything is great. What a beautiful launch today. And with today's successful launch of AX3, the teams at NASA's Johnson Space Center will be monitoring Dragon's flight to the International Space Station over the next 36 hours. NASA's role in this journey really kicks in at a period called Integrated Operations, where Dragon is much closer to the station. At this point, NASA, SpaceX, and Axiom Space teams are all in lockstep to get the crew safely docked. The teams here are preparing for a docking 
bringing of AX3 to the station on Saturday morning. For now, that will be it from us in Mission Control Houston, and we'll be back with you Saturday for docking. And for now, we'll send it back to you, Kate and John. Thanks, Courtney. And we did hear that we had nominal uh, opening of the nose cones, so that is great news. Yeah. Now, over the next 30 hours, uh, 30 plus hours, really, Dragon will execute a series of burns to gradually raise and line up the AX3 crew for docking with the International Space Station and what we refer to as the activation and rendezvous phase of the mission. In just a few minutes, the crew will change out of their spacesuits and get a little bit more comfortable for flight and uh, something that would be my favorite part, enjoy their first meal right. aboard the spacecraft. Over the course of their flight, they will have a rest period that will last for about eight hours. Before they arrive at the space station, we will have two potential opportunities to chat briefly with the crew on orbit, one around 3.15 p.m. Pacific and another around 6.20 p.m. Pacific. Dragon SpaceX, environments look good for suit doffing and the cabin camera is soon to be configured, your go for suit doffing. Copy, we'll put 4.012 in work. All right, so that call out there just saying that the crew is clear to take off their suits. As I had mentioned, they're able to get a little bit more comfortable for the upcoming journey. Now, we were talking about some on-orbit opportunities to chat with the crew. While we are hopeful that one of those opportunities will work out, neither opportunity is guaranteed as they are, unfortunately, dependent on both crew schedule and ground station coverage. However, if we are able to support, we'll make an announcement on our social media channels no later than 15 minutes before the event start time. In the meantime, be sure to keep tabs on the mission at axiomspace.com, and you can also track... And Dragon cameras are external. You can also track Dragon's flight on spacex.com slash launches. Right, like you mentioned, Kate, even if we aren't able to talk live with the crew, we will continue to provide updates on the mission across our social media channels. And then, as Dragon and the AX3 crew approach the International Space Station early on the morning of January 20th, we will pick back up with our live joint coverage of the AX3 crew's docking to station with NASA. So please keep an eye on Axiom and SpaceX social channels for updates, as there will be plenty of incredible moments to share with you over the course of their mission. So from all of us at Axiom Space, thank you SpaceX, thank you NASA, and thank you for tuning in. This is just the beginning, and we hope to see you soon.